right, guys, welcome to the Hunting Illinois podcast. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about the turkey season that uh, it was my turkey season. And we had late season turkey tags here for the fifth season and on some public land. And uh, Adam and I got to go out and Adam was with me five of the six days. I went out six times. Uh, all six days I got out uh, when I was able to. And, what a um, trooper. What, what a, a trooper. trooper. I know it was it's really rough. That's but a lot uh, of mornings. What time were you all waking up? Oh my gosh. Well, it's a, I mean, as everybody knows, public land is a bit of a drive. So I had to drive 45 minutes to get there. And so I was getting up at uh 315 or 250, depending on what part I was hunting. So very early mornings. Yeah. I was getting up at about 330 each day, uh, just cause I'm staying a little bit closer to the public land that we're hunting. So not as far of a drive, but Still didn't want to wake up too late and uh, make Jason upset. Plus, I'm always excited for waking up. So it's just it's kind of uh, built into the body clock by now. Yeah, that's right. By the third day, it was going pretty good. The first two were a little rough. And then uh, we got it going from there. The, the problem with my house is the dogs wake up. And then that my wife was upset for a bit. But after that, the dogs got used to me uh, waking up at 330. <laughs> the canine alarm clocks. Oh, yeah. So yeah, so we started out, it's it's Thursday now. We started out Saturday and um we'll I go think over the season started Friday. So yeah, season start because we were coming back from our uh where were we? Oklahoma, Oklahoma. Right, yep. for the broken R3 air. symposium. Mm -hmm. We uh learned a lot about R3 and talked to a bunch of other states <clears throat> and uh met some awesome to, groups too. Yes, yeah, some awesome, awesome groups. groups. That we're going to be talking to uh, in the future here shortly. So look forward to that. Got to talk strategy and see what everybody else is doing across the country in terms of R3. So we didn't get to hunt Friday. Right. We hit the ground running hard. on Three of us did a little bit of fishing. Like, I don't know, 30 minutes worth, Jason. Yeah, yeah there. before thunderstorm rolled in and cut our Yeah, we got chased it. by lightning. Mm. It was worth it. I, I'm going back uh, over there. That was awesome. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, we were on Lake Tanny Como. Beautiful water. I mean, you could see, even though the water was rushing pretty fast, I feel like you could see 10 feet straight down. So you could wow. see, like when I caught that fish, Jason saw it right away. He's like, oh, it's a fish. He could see it eight feet in the water. The water's so clear. It was crazy. And that was rolling. Yeah, it, it was, was flooded. As fast as it ever goes. So uh, yeah, pretty cool. We definitely uh, learned to hunt Lake Tanny Como trout fishing uh, trip should should be in the plans. Yeah, I mean, I'm so used to chocolate milk whenever it's flooded. I couldn't believe that it was still clear. I can only imagine what it's like on a calm day. I mean, that's just insane. It looked like a swimming pool, it's like turquoise. Yeah, yeah definitely awesome. beautiful. So yes, yeah, so we got to get back over that. And then that, that uh, yeah, anyway, so yeah, Lily's Landing was a great um, experience because I mean, the guys who worked there were great. So if they ever hear this, thank you guys. You guys are really, really nice guys. But, uh, okay, so Saturday we got out. And we got out with uh, my my old friend, Ed, who has just gotten into hunting the past couple of years and uh, been exposing him to different types of hunting. So this was his first spring turkey where he could actually go out and hear some gobbles and things like that. So he came out with us on Saturday. And uh, we went and Adam had spotted it out, uh, spotted it out had scouted it out and had seen kind of some experiences with other people throughout the season i think adam after we got my bird today um you're at what five for seven yeah with everybody in uh, my little hunting group including my own two tags uh including your tag we mm -hmm. filled five out of seven tags on public land this spring so far yep so, so i benefited from your previous experience already hunting over there and other areas around there but uh so we went out and we set up in a corner of a field. We had decoys out and I was a little separated from Adam and Ed who were set up a little bit farther down the row and they were going to be calling and I was just going to be sitting. And uh, we saw a ton of birds that day and we it started out with four, four gobblers in the field that I couldn't see what they could see. And then about a half hour later, a flock of about 12 of them came out of the one corner uh, the only problem is the field we were looking at was what, like 300 yards wide and maybe 700 yards long by the time it got out to the, to the road there. So, yeah. I mean, it, it was a big field. So we sat on this field a lot this week. And the problem we kept having was just seeing birds out of range and not getting their attention to come over to us. 
Um, so that was kind of the first lesson that we were kind of picking up as we went along was just how can we get these birds to be close to us? So that was Saturday. Did you pay attention to your decoys at all? No, no, no. It was pretty uh, shocking. I think uh, like that first morning, I want to say that there was a couple hens that flew down in the field, uh, kind of right off the roost. And they instantly left the toms and I assume, you know, went to their nests since it's pretty late in the season. So they're, you know, going to uh, sit on their nest with their eggs. And which usually is a good sign because that means, you know, turkeys without or male turkeys without hens. And we ran into that a good portion of the week where it was just toms and jakes hanging out together and not caring about anything else. And they're just having a good time in the nice weather, I guess. But it was uh, kind of frustrating because that's not usually how, at least in my experience, how they act. Mm-hmm. And what kind of decoy setup were, were you all running? Uh, most of the time, it was just a jake and a hen. So mm-hmm. I don't know if, uh, you know, just a, just a single hen, I don't know if that would have got their attention more since, you know, all the jakes were hanging out with the toms. Uh, we did try that a couple times. Um, and it almost worked for us. I'm sure we'll get into that here in a second. But yeah, um, yeah, we just went with the classic Jake and Han setup. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. So Saturday, uh, saw a lot of turkeys from far away. A lot of deer too, and uh, other wildlife. Saw barred a uh, barred barred owl and uh, some other stuff that day. And then uh, and then we got a lot of morels because that was right after the rain that that was flooded out uh, flooded us out in Missouri. The final lot. Us here. The final lot. What's a yep. lot? Oh gosh, like a, a Ziploc bag, a gallon size Ziploc bag full. Yeah, we probably found the, those two days. We probably found, I don't know, close to a pound and a half, two pounds. Yeah, I think not it was many, a- but they were they were mm-hmm. like big and uh, mm-hmm. you know full of water from the rain. So yeah, yeah, not- a nice a nice mess, you know. But you yeah. didn't find like a five gallon bucket where it's like no. a block party. No, no, no. I guess that's the whole relativity thing there. So a relative amount I, before that, I had only found two. So finding about 30 or more was a lot for me. <laughs> oh, that's a score for sure. Yeah. Big time. Yep. So, uh, so we got those. And then on Sunday we went back and now this time, instead of being on the, the side the West side of the field, we went to the East side of the field to where we thought we saw the turkeys spend most of the time at. So we tried to get over to where we thought they would be coming out. And then they decided to go in the middle. So they came from the north side and stayed in the middle the whole way across and never came to the uh, east side that we were at. So, again, seeing birds out of range and then going for long hikes. Both So Saturday and Sunday, we were out all day. And uh, both days we went walking. And there's a lot of fields on the land that we were hunting in different sections. And we went everywhere and checked all the parking lots. And... uh, put a lot of miles on those two days uh, before we got into the work week. And then, uh, and then Monday I went out by myself and I probably had the best opportunity I had up until today uh, on Monday when I was by myself, but I kind of blew it. And what happened was we knew that one of the toms was roosting in the one corner of that field and we hadn't really pushed it yet. So I was deciding that we're going to go push it. So I got in there and I sat almost underneath the tree without realizing it and uh, was sitting there and he was gobbling away. And then I was having back flashes, flashbacks of seeing birds out of range. And I was not planning on calling to him. And then I decided to call to him and then he gobbled the first time I called to him. And then I tried to call to him again because I was getting greedy. And then he flew out of the tree completely opposite direction from where I was (laughs) because he didn't sit (laughs) I didn't have, and also I didn't have any decoys out either. So, uh, he, he was flew he like right up above you. He was probably, I didn't realize how far, how close he was. I thought he was like 30, 50 yards. I just thought he was in the woods, but then when he flew away and I saw where he was, he was probably 30 yards away on a tree that was on the field. I thought he was in the woods, but he was not. So me calling and then him not seeing anything or, or being able to see me, even though I was in a bush, uh, was enough for him to get freaked out and be like, no, thanks. And just book out of there. And, um, so that happened. But then after that, uh, I saw 
a coyote that was almost a full white coyote come across the field. So at this point, I thought I just blew my whole day. I'm like, there's a coyote. No turkey wants to come out and hang out with a coyote. Uh, this other Tom that was supposed to fly right down in front of me is out of the picture now. And so I actually started texting that Adam had texted me like, Hey, how's it going? I'm like, ah, oh, I got to go down to the other field. This isn't working out for me. So then I start packing up my stuff and wait, uh, wait, you got to back up You're yeah. all a mostly white. You mean like albino? It wasn't quite albino. There was some gray patches to it, but it was, a, it was the whitest coyote I've ever seen. It was much more pale than normal. Okay. But yeah. Not quite an albino. I right. mean, that's pretty cool though. That makes, oh, yeah. I mean, even that makes a hunt worth it. Oh, for sure. No, man. I mean, we saw again, like this, these six days that we were out, I saw more wildlife in these six days than I have in a long time th throughout a whole deer season. I mean, just the amount of deer we saw. Um, I mean, just seeing deer cross that field um constantly and and just driving in and out of uh the site too in the morning i mean just seeing raccoons and possums on the road and uh other wildlife so it was just, it was really cool but uh so then uh i decided to pack up my stuff i tell adam i'm heading down to the other field and as soon as i text him that text i go to walk out of my spot and there are some bowls and rises in that field and i couldn't really see to my right before i left and I take a step out into the field. I look out and there are two jakes. I, I walk, I take about 20 steps and then I get up my head above the one rise and I can see down to one of the little bowls. And there are two jakes that probably were about 40 yards, not 40, that's too close. But I saw two jakes that were probably 100 yards away from me. And so I quick fall down on the ground and crawl over to the woods. And then I get set up again, uh, kind of close to where we were at on Sunday, which was down by a fallen down tree. And then, so I start calling again. And then uh, they, I, I poke my head up and they aren't where they were. They kind of went another hundred yards down to a grassy patch on the very far side of the woods. And then uh, as I was messing with those guys, uh, two big toms came out and started strutting. And it was awesome to watch that because uh, the one biggest tom chased those jakes away. And then um, the Jakes just kind of sat back 20 yards away from him and watched him strut. And the other Tom sat back 20 yards on the other side and watched him strut. So you have these three. That's a power move. Yep. You have power these three, three males watching the big male strut around. And uh, this is the funniest part of the, of the week. As I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there watching all this through binoculars because I'm pretty safe. I mean, these things are about 200 yards away from me. I try calling. Every time I call, he fluffs back up. Um, he gobbles once in a while. And then if you ever, if he's ever not fluffed up, I call again and then he fluffs back up. So he's hearing me, but uh, I'm sitting there looking through my binoculars and all of a sudden I start hearing uh, a putt noise. So uh, there's a lot of birds out there this time of year. I mean, there's, it sounds like you're in a jungle. I mean, it's constant, constant songbirds. And I hear putt, 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 putt. And then I'm sitting there looking through my binoculars. I'm like, you know, that sounds like a turkey. I put my binoculars down. I look to my right and within arm's reach of me is a hen just staring at me. <laughs> and I didn't see because my eyes were in a binoculars. I did not see her. And it probably was for a much longer time than it should have been. <laughs> so, uh, so then she's, I don't, I barely move. All I do is lower the binoculars and then she sees me and then kind of just like walks away and just putts and walks away. And then uh, I think eventually she makes it down to the trail down there and all those guys, I think, see her. And then they all, they chase something. All four of them ran off into the field or out of the field. Uh, and then down this one trail. And then that's all that happened on Monday. I didn't really see anything else after that. But uh, so that was fun having a hen almost walk into my lap without me paying attention. So then Adam came back out on Tuesday and uh, we got set up. Where do we sit that time, Adam? Tuesday, I think we sat uh, in one of those bottom fields. Yep. Um, just because the few mornings that we hunted, we heard gobbling from down, from down there. And Monday night, I went back to roost, uh, just in the evening to see if we can hear anything and know exactly where to set up on Tuesday morning. And uh, I was glassing that bottom field and saw three times walking into the corner where we figured they would be roosting. So we sat down on the edge of the field in the bottoms on Tuesday morning, and. Uh, didn't hear a single one of those toms that we saw walk into the woods on Monday night. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, 
kind of disheartening just because we didn't hear, I don't even think we heard one gobble that day. We, that's right. Yeah. We were getting, we that were was also the, the first day of like that, uh, the heat wave that has hit us. It was like <clears throat> close to seven, you know, like seven in the morning. It was already almost like 85 degrees or something like that. So yep. I think that definitely put a damper on the gobbling activity. We did see some hens though. And we did yep. go on another, he another was hike. Excited you know? though, huh? Yes, the mosquitoes were going nuts. Yeah, the mosquitoes definitely ramped up. But I think that was probably the low point of the week because we went from seeing toms every day at least. I mean, just but again, we were moving we left that big field up on top of that ridge because it was so big and we just could not get down to where we could get them within range. Went down to the lower field, which is a smaller field. Adam seen toms there and then not see anything or even hear anything. And I mean, all the other mornings you heard gobbling from all over the place out there. And uh on Tuesday there was nothing. So then uh Tuesday night, Adam, is that when the you difference a day can make, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Really? And and then also moving around and trying different things. And luckily, like Adam had said, he was out staying at a friend's house this whole week and he was trying to roost them so that way I didn't have to drive the 45 minutes out there to to do that. So he was a huge help um in us finding the birds that we were able to find. And I think Tuesday night's the first time you roosted them up on the ridge of a different even like a couple miles down the road at a different parking lot, you found these other guys, right? Yep. Yep. The, I mean, going back like the past few different tags that we've been, uh, you know, hunting on here on the public land, roosting in the evening has been like really, really, really slow this year. And I think it's due to the weather just because in the early part of the season, it was like cold and rainy. Then all of a sudden it turned like super warm. Um, so I think the weather has really played a part in, low gobbling activity um throughout the season and it's been tough to like locate the turkeys at in the evening time to know where to go in the morning which it's hard to come up with a plan when you don't really exactly know where to go or where they are located uh because you know you're just kind of shooting into the wind and seeing what the heck happens so but luckily yes what was that tuesday night Mm -hmm. uh went to a totally different spot um on a big ridge and found three turkeys that were actually gobbling on the roost in the evening. So we knew where they were for Wednesday morning, which was a huge confidence boost. And, uh, you know, we were actually able to put up, put on a game plan for specific birds that we thought we might know what they do instead of just going to a field and kind of hoping that something comes into the decoy. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, that was, that was definitely a nice morale boost. Oh yeah, man, for sure. And uh, I got to say, talking about morale boost, and this is something I've been thinking about, and it's something that we were doing, and I think it's a benefit of hunting with someone else uh, who's on the same wavelength as you two, and almost a fake confidence that you need to have throughout the week to keep your morale up when you're unsure of what's going on. And I mean, even on Tuesday, when we weren't seeing anything, we were walking around all the fields, every field we came to, we're like, oh, there's going to be one in this field. And then we come up to that field and there, there wasn't. And I mean, you can almost see it from far away. Like there's probably not going to be anything in here. And then once in a while, we'd actually kick a hen out or something like that and be like, oh, wow, there goes a hen. And I think we actually saw a bearded hen too. Um, we kicked mm-hmm. a bearded hen out of a bush. But uh, I think that is almost, it's an important thing, even if you don't believe that you're going to see something you need to, it helps you stay sharp and helps you stay aware and, and be willing to have the confidence to be like, Hey, there is going to be something around here because I mean, you're out in the woods and you're there's animals out there and you could stumble upon them at any time. And like, if Adam was there on Monday, when I was disheartened and was ready to get out of there and walked out and ran into those Jake's um, there's a chance that we would have stuck it out and sat there. And then the Jake's might've walked over to me or not, but having that other person there, And having that kind of banner back and forth of constantly being like, hey, man, there's going to be another one around the corner. And even if you believe it or not, I think it's a a game changer. It's hard to, uh, well, I noticed this personally, like if I go hunting by myself, I second guess myself a lot because there's so many different outcomes and you never know. I mean, you're dealing with a turkey, obviously a wild animal. Sometimes they respond to your call. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they are completely silent, but they're still in the area. And you're never 100% sure, but you know that they're there and you don't know exactly, should I move? Should I not? Should I just sit in one spot and call? Or should I try to go somewhere else where I've seen them previously? So yeah, definitely I agree with what you're saying because it's hard to uh, 
stick to a plan when you've seen a lot of action in other areas and but you know it's a day that you don't see or hear much and it's it's hard to pick the right thing because you always think like oh if i leave here now maybe in 10 minutes there's going to be one Mm -hmm. um but yeah you gotta always just like you said keep your hopes up stay sharp make sure you're glass in every field because turkeys although they're like in the sun if they're strutting you can see them pretty easily but they know how to hide in a field pretty well like in a dark you know shady corner or something Mm -hmm. and you might you know stumble upon one on accident you just got to be super diligent and watch do a lot of listening and a lot of watching um instead of you know moving around so move slow and, and stay diligent oh for sure uh on monday after i had uh had gone through and I, my day was basically over i was heading back to get get to work um i checked the different parking lots and i saw a hen uh walking through one of the campgrounds that you drive through to get to another site and it was plain as day it's like oh look there's a hen like oh cool and then i stopped the car just to check her out and she was in slightly tall grass and then she just squatted and it basically went invisible i could see a little bit of her head i had binoculars out i was looking at her and she saw me and just just went down and all you could see was like a little bit of a golf club head sticking up out of some tall grass but they're so model brown that they blend right in i mean they're a camouflage so um there could be a turkey right next to you and you wouldn't know it until they move or come out. I mean, it's, you got to keep, keep your eye out for sure. Mm-hmm. But uh, so then that brings us to Wednesday, which was the the most exciting day compared to Thursday because Thursday had actually worked out Wednesday. It didn't. So Wednesday we went to that Ridge and we got there earlier than normal because it was a farther away site. And we had to walk a little bit farther compared to the other fields. So we got up, got set up. Uh, we were on a fallen down tree again in some open woods. So it's the top of a ridge. Adam found that they were on the point of a ridge and we were on the flat top. And Adam was on the one side of the fallen down tree. I, I had my back against it. And it, I had to be very still uh, for this to work because there was no brush or anything between us and where the turkeys are going to be coming from. And they had so, just recently burned that ridge, uh, which I assume was pretty late because it's like everywhere else is super green and washed now. And this is like the one ridge that's still barren and a bunch of, uh, you know, black soot and this stuff everywhere. If you walk through, you still get it on your pants and stuff. So I assume that they recently just burned it, which has its advantages and disadvantages just because, yes, like Jason said, it's super open. Uh but it's perfect turkey habitat. So, you know, that something should be in there. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yep. So then uh, we got there, we got set up. Uh, we put one <sighs> hen out uh, for the decoys. Uh, Adam's theory, which he explained to me, is that when they're on the roost and they see a Jake, they kind of know what males are around because the males are going to be gobbling. So if they see a male that's like right near the roost, they're like, how did he get here? Where was he set up at? It it's, may confuse them. So we went with a safe bed of just having a hen out and uh, less aggressive. So they did everything that we thought they would do. So they gobbled uh, right at dawn and then they got down and it was really cool to see through this open woods. And it was kind of like just these big trees, open ground. And then on the far side, there was this light green uh, greenery that you could see. So as their silhouettes move through the trees, you could see these black silhouettes on this really light kind of lime green leafy stuff that's on the far side of the ridge and uh you could see him coming from way off and they were calling the whole time and interacting with adam's calls and then uh they came up and they got to about 48 yards and which is outer limits of the shotgun i mean maybe a little bit maybe they might have gotten to 45 40 depending on which tree they kind of crossed in front of but we thought they were going to be coming in and then they decided to hook and go uh, keep going and then walk away from us and go off the ridge. And Adam says that he heard a, uh, a hen calling to him. So we, that's why we think they kind of saw our hen, no, no, uh, no Jake around her to, to make them threatened and thought maybe she'd follow them with them. And uh, maybe they thought like, okay, well, we're here. She saw us. And then we're going to go after this other hen that's calling over here now. So uh, they walked off and we never got a chance to have them again on Wednesday. Yeah, I think that they probably would have uh, been a little bit more committed to the hen had the real hen not called. Because like mm-hmm. right when they got to around like 50 yards, 
a hen probably like a hundred yards to our right um, down off the ridge cut really hard and really loud and like instantly they just started they just like skirted the decoy di- you know like went diagonal towards the real and basically got between like way down the ridge but between the, the decoy hen and the real hen you know waiting for i assume the hens to come to them because again uh you know in nature the hens come to the toms when they gobble and uh the toms generally don't come to the hens so we were trying to trick them but they they wanted to go to the real hen mm-hmm. I, I gotta say to though li- listening to you guys you know talk about your justification for why turkey <laughs> is great because it reminds me of like one of my favorite aspects of hunting is Forget about all the adulting you have to do, you know, your HOA meetings and all the the bills you have to pay. And for a week, you just, you had to pretend to be a turkey and like, that's refreshing, right? That's, that's, that's what we need. That's what we all need. So yeah, that, that, that's why I was smiling because you guys are (laughs) like, well, this is why the turkey, we're pretty sure, you know, this is the justification, (laughs) but it could have been this, you know, and and that, that's just great because I, I feel it, you know, I've been there and that's, uh, that's why we keep coming back, you know, just listen yeah. to all these stories you guys have and you haven't even got to the harvest yet. Yeah. You know? That's great. Well, all the, like Adam said, right when we got started was, uh, he's like, well, we might get one first thing tomorrow. Like I was talking to him on Friday. He's like, we might get one on Saturday morning, but, uh, he's like, we kind of want to go like day two is the best because you, you got to work for it. Well, day six was, <laughs> with last day of the season day six and uh and also uh last night i told adam i'm like i didn't want to bring this up but uh but tomorrow's my birthday so i, I really i don't i don't want to jinx it but if we're gonna get a bird it's gonna be tomorrow and well it's the last day of the season so it had to be tomorrow so it worked out got me a birthday bird today and uh so we went back to that same ridge and uh we we did the exact same setup the only thing we changed was we added the jake to the decoys and they did the same thing, kind of. They flew down, and instead of walking towards us, they walked towards us right away yesterday. So we thought, I mean, we could have been done by 545 yesterday when they walked off the ridge. But today, from 545 to 645, they stayed at the exact same spot and strutted for an hour before uh, we changed things up. And before I get to that, um, that goes back to another reason why hunting turkeys, especially, I think is really nice to hunt with two people because I was sitting there watching them for an hour strutting. And then Adam, who was just adjacent to me behind the log could not see them. So for an hour, Adam had to be like, what are they doing now? I'm like, they haven't moved. What are they doing now? (laughs) They're still in the same spot. And I'm like, Oh, they went to the right. Oh, no, they're back now. And it was just an hour of us talking to each other, me trying to tell him what I was seeing. And that point should have messed with them like, oh, one one took out a violin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not in day six. Day six, we were there was no messing around. Uh, so but I want to give uh, I want to give my justification on decoy setup uh, on the last day in the same spot because we were just talking about how we just put the hen out the day before. Um, we didn't set up like I think if I, when I mapped it out from where they were roosted to where we set up was about 170 yards. And generally on a roost hunt, I would like to be a little bit closer than that, but there really, again, wasn't much cover on this Ridge. I mean, there's big mature trees, but nothing in front of them. Um, so, you know, it'd be hard to get away, you know, especially with two people, sometimes it'd be hard to get away with sneaking in, not to mention, you know, all the sticks that you're going to be cracking on the way in. Um, but the, there's a bunch of leaves on the trees already. So I figured that they probably, with the way, you know, the big trees, big timber, lots of uh, younger, uh, smaller diameter trees. I mean, like Jason just said, you know, we were sitting like almost in the same exact position, but I couldn't see the turkeys for an hour. I figured that the turkeys wouldn't be able to see the decoys from the roost. Because as previously we mentioned, sometimes when they do see decoys on the roost, they get a little bit spooky. Um, just because again, they, I mean, they, they live out there every day, so they know exactly what's next to them. They know what turkeys are in the area and where those turkeys roost generally. Uh, so my idea was that they probably won't see the decoys again off the roost, 
but we wanted to have that Jake out uh, to intimidate the Toms a little bit once they actually saw him when they hit the ground. And I'll let Jason continue, but that is short words. That's basically what happened. So I'll let Jason take it off. Unless Curtis, you were you going to say something? Did you no, have a just just oh. no, soaking it all in. So, okay. so, all right. So we sat there for an hour of me describing what was happening to Adam as uh, Adam continued to call and uh, and kind of keep him interested. And um, there, again, there's three of them. We think it was two Toms and a Jake. And uh, and I would I would have been happy to take any of them. We were talking about that about that too. Um, even on day one, I mean, I if you if if you put out a lot of effort and you end up getting a Jake, that's awesome. If you end up getting a, a giant bird, that's cool too. Um, so I was there's not going to be wrong with the Jake. So, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's things you can do with a Jake, uh, cooking wise that you wouldn't want to do with a big old bird. So, uh, yeah, if you do get that opportunity, man, pluck that bird, keep the skin on and, and maybe, put, you know, potentially deep fry the whole thing or something, which you wouldn't even think about doing with a four or five year old bird, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, no, no shame in a Jake. Mm -mm. Nope. But uh, we were lucky enough to have two giant toms uh, in front of us. So, uh, so Adam, after about an hour of, of them sitting there strutting, again, we were having flashbacks of birds walking away. And he was like, we got to do something or else they're just going to get disinterested and, and walk off. And we weren't even sure if they could see the decoys. We just knew that they were strutting over there and they could hear him calling. Um, so – he again decided. probably waiting for the hen mm -hmm. to come to them because mm -hmm. they were up on a kind of on a rise towards the end of the point of the ridge so you know if a hen was lonely uh on that ridge she would have eventually seen them and i'm sure worked off towards where they were strutting at because they were i mean jason couldn't miss them they were dancing around for an hour mm -hmm. back and forth so that's probably what they were waiting on yeah what and, kind of call were you chirping on? Hot mm -hmm. call or mouth call? Or at first, uh, super soft calling on the pot call. Um, again, I just wanted to like imitate just a soft yelp, especially late in the season. You don't want to be too aggressive, just because these birds have potentially been called at before. Um, so I didn't want to throw the whole kitchen sink at them. I just want—I was going just uh, you know soft yelps a little bit of cutting uh, and a few purrs and not often I called maybe when they were on the limb after they started gobbling two times. And then uh, they gobbled pretty decent once they flew down for like the first 20 minutes. Uh, and I would, one thing I like to do is I like to wait for them to gobble two or three times before I call again, and then give it a good waiting period of just silence and then see if they can gobble again before I call just to see if they're actually interested. I don't know if that's really how it works, but that's how I think about it in my head. Again, well, just trying to be hard, hard to get. You know? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, so that's what I did and just kept it super quiet and super soft. Um, again, didn't want to get too aggressive. Mm -hmm. But yeah, man, no, you had some solid self-control on that because I can imagine how easy it is to, to just start calling constantly <laughs> as soon as that's what I, I mean, I did it for the one time I was calling by myself. Uh, and also I should have said this to begin with, I got, I've gotten one Turkey in my life when I was 18. So I am a bit of a newbie at, at Turkey hunting. So having Adam with me was a, was a huge, huge plus, but, um, so, so, okay. So then they're not moving. We are scared. They're just going to walk off. Um, we don't know if they even see the decoys. So then Adam decides, He's, uh, he's like, I got to roll back and see if I move back a little bit. Maybe that will get him uh, to come over. And sure enough, he only went down the distance of the fallen down tree. I mean, it was probably 30 feet, 40 feet down the, down yeah, the fallen down like tree. 10 yards, 15 yards, maybe. Yeah. But uh, it was nice because it was just like we were, or Jason was sitting like in the, the top V of the tree. So he was sitting in, and then I was sitting right behind that. So I didn't have to crawl like over a big branch until I got to the back. But yeah, I basically just uh, just crawled on my hands and knees right along, like super tight up against the, the trunk of the tree and just walked or crawled super slow until I can get to the back to then where I just crossed over and then basically sat in all the like brambled thick stuff um, of the mess of the broken tree. So that's where I got to. 
And I was telling Jason that the reason why I thought we should do this was because I've had many experiences of trying to move on turkeys and them being in the same exact spot where we just were like five minutes later. So I was like, we're going to try to do this, except the guy with the shotgun is going to be in the same position and the guy calling is just going to be moving, pretending to be gone. So just yeah. for anybody who's listening, who's a, you know, relatively new turkey hunter, that's another game you have to play in your head because you never know if you're going to be right or not. But I've had that so many times where I try to get closer and then all of a sudden, you know, the turkeys have been in the same spot for an hour, similar to this or whatnot. And I'm like, okay, we got to do something because they're not coming in. And then we move like, you know, get back in the thick stuff and maybe run down the, the, the uh, field edge and then try to pop back in. And the next thing we know, they're in the same exact spot where we just were. So mm -hmm. that's, that's what good. we're doing. That's, that's the old uh, public land misdirection play. Yeah. Like, yeah. Turkeys are like, oh, the hunters are gone. I can finally go to my spot. I'm like, oh, yeah. psych. Exactly. <laughs> Still here. <laughs> that's good. We tried to trick them. Yep. But, uh, so yeah, so he, this moved a cup. I mean, it was, I could, I could hit him with a rock from where he was to where he went. I mean, he did not go far, but that little bit of movement got him to come right to us. I mean, they, they, they did exactly what we wanted him to do. Um, the big Tom came first and then the little, the still a pretty big Tom followed him, but, uh, the big Tom came in and again, Adam and my view were different and we had, a tree that we had range found and there's a tree that was missing, missing bark. And that was that 40 yard tree. And he's like, okay, if it's within that tree, shoot it. And then it came from a different angle that wasn't exactly near that tree. And there was one long shot I almost took, but it, it looked like they were coming. So I didn't take it. I'm like, oh, it, it's, it's coming in. So then it came in, but then there was this giant uh, shag bark hickory that was right in front of me. And I knew that the turkey was coming in and I had the gun up this entire, basically since dawn, I've had the gun up to my face. I mean, I could not move. So, I mean, it, my shoulders killing me, not from shooting the gun, but from just being in a yoga pose all morning. But, uh, so this, this Tom is on the other side of this shag bark and then Adam's behind me going, shoot it, Jason, shoot it, shoot it, Jason, shoot it. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't, I didn't say anything, but in my head, I'm like, dude, I would, if I could, and he doesn't know what I can see. And I couldn't see the bird at all. And then when I was it not popped, yelling, by the way, I was, no. I was whisper yelling. I said, it, Jason, wait, whisper it's right yelling. there. It's in, right there. In quiet woods, it felt like you were screaming at me. And in, uh, in the street, whisper yelling. Yeah, whisper yelling. <laughs> yeah. Shoot it, Jason. Shoot it. Shoot it, so Jason. Awesome. That's what we're doing. <laughs> so then the, it, it pops out on the other side of that, of that shag bark right at our decoys. And, uh, and then I, I took it right there. And, um, it was it was awesome. I mean, it was it was six days of we saw turkeys every day, even if it was hens or not, or toms, but uh, saw so many other animals and and did a couple different scenarios. It was just it was it was the best turkey season I've ever had. I mean, that was it was just a blast. And and it turned out to be I mean, Adam, it's it's in his top uh, birds that he's ever helped get, and he's he's gotten so many birds over the years. Um, even at a young, you're a pretty young dude, but I mean, you've been hunting turkeys here for a while and, and I mean, you're, you saw five this year. So, uh, it was awesome. Yeah, yeah. it was definitely, uh, and, I mean, no way really to tell like the age of the turkey or whatnot, but it was definitely an impressive turkey, uh, especially for public land. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but yeah, that was awesome. It was, uh, like when Jason was just saying, when I was telling him to shoot it, I was laying basically on my stomach and I could see under the fallen tree. So I could see like the right side of Jason's right leg under the, you know, the trunk of the tree. And then I just saw the white head and it kept on getting closer and closer. And I was like, why is he, is he going to let it <laughs> come right to his feet? Like, is he, you know, I don't know what's going on right now. So I was getting amped up. Um, but yeah, I mean, he came to like 15 yards. Yeah right there you know and his buddy was right behind him coming up so mm -hmm. i had like the perfect little viewing window which was awesome to see mm -hmm. i feel like one of the morals of this story is like what a difference a couple yards can make what a difference one day can make what you know what a difference just a little added confidence to to keep you out in the woods you know a little bit more it's like uh the the difference between success and failure is so 
minute. It's uh, yeah, it's pretty much whenever it happens, you're almost like, I mean, it almost feels like, wow, something went wrong. Cause we actually, we did it right. You know, cause it yeah. goes wrong so many times, but then when you tell this story, you know, years from now, you'll just remember the good and kind of forget all that bad. And uh, yep. it just turns into a, a positive story, but man, that's great. That's, that's like hunting in a nutshell right there. That one, that one week that you all experience, that's a, mm-hmm. a good representation. Yeah. And yeah. I think another takeaway, especially uh, from newer turkey hunters would be, uh, you know, if you don't, harvest a turkey in the one setup like for example this on this ridge we learned what the turkeys do on that ridge on wednesday morning and you know even though they almost came in and we almost got a shot it was i mean i want to say you know it would have been nice and easy and over and done with if we did get a shot but we learned what the birds do and that's on that specific ridge and they didn't we didn't spook them or anything um, they just, you know, simply worked off. So we were confident that they were going to be there again uh, Thursday morning. And we kind of knew what their habits and their, and their, you know, life looks like up there. So we were confident that we're going to be able to pull something off just because we learned a little bit of information from the previous day. So mm-hmm. don't be afraid to, you know, go back and retry, maybe just change something up slightly but just because it doesn't work out one day, it doesn't mean it's not going to work out the next. You know, yeah. So. And, and the day that we weren't successful, they did, they, they did a textbook, what we thought they were going to do, which was walk right at us. And, and they seemed interested and then came right at us. The day that we actually got them, they sat there for an hour dancing around and didn't walk towards us at all. Mm-hmm. So it's, I mean, it's so every situational situation, every situation situational, I guess is what the, <laughs> the yes. philosophers say no <laughs> i think pat mcafee said no uh well you get you all had a lot of time to be out there uh philosophizing yeah yes. yeah and the good thing about turkey hunt is you know must do it before work i mean we were out of there by eight o'clock so uh a lot of that action was pretty early in the morning but yeah, you put uh, in a put in a full day before it's time to clock in yeah right. i got yeah i think we're all ready for some naps but uh <laughs> i'm gonna sleep into seven tomorrow <laughs> but uh no man i just want to say thanks to adam uh yeah i mean he 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 was he's great i mean i i it's a bummer that you can't be a mentor to to everybody you only got so much time and and you have your own season you gotta worry about but man uh it was a it was it was it's fun being the mentee once in a while too because you get that side of it as well so um no man it was was just an awesome week all in all oh yeah i mean i love doing it i love taking out new people especially like I mean, I was so close to the turkey this morning. Like he was in, in in gun range for sure for me if I was the one with the tag. So it's almost like even though I'm not the one pulling the trigger, I'm sure I've said this before, but it's like almost like I, you know, harvested myself too. I'm, I did everything I could have to get the turkey to come in other than shoot it. So I, yep. but I watched you do it, which is awesome because that's your first what, Illinois turkey and first yep. turkey in a good amount of years so yeah first public land turkey too the one i got back home was back in pennsylvania was uh was a private land that we had access to but um no man yeah and i mean and when and after we i shot it you ran up to it and you're like dude this is the biggest one i've ever gotten on public land and then he's like well i mean you've ever gotten i'm like oh no man it's, it's <laughs> us man it's, it's we got it we got it so no it's uh, it was awesome uh so yeah uh with that um we get to wait till squirrel season, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So, so we um, got a lot of fishing to do. It's oh, not yeah. quite hunting, but hey, it's still outdoors. It's still fun and provides you some uh, some yummy meals. So, oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You get a good old fish tournament going over here at my uh, HOA pond. But uh, yes, sir. But uh, hey, uh, anyone listening still, we appreciate you and keep an eye out. We will be having webinars and workshops still throughout the summer. Uh, we're going to be doing some uh, all kinds of stuff, some some real general kind of things. We're going to be gearing towards deer too, but then uh, stay tuned and keep an eye out on the website and uh, any updates we have for that. So thank you all for listening and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.